Hey, Dr. Greer. Stoked uh, to be here. Good. Glad you're um, here. So in 2012, there was said to be you know, a shift in the way we think. And for me, that was the case. Like consciousness, the word consciousness was in my head just constantly. And that led me down the path to finding work. So I was just wondering if you've noticed any increase in this kind of interest in UFOs or if you think it's just the grand scheme of the universe. Your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know about 2012 per se, but it, it has in the last couple of years gone up exponentially. Every, all the interest in this. Uh, I mean, to the point that you even have Lockheed Martin putting out information that by 2020 something they're going to have a fusion generator that will run everything. That was in the past month. So what, what you, things are moving along and it, it has been a big move up. Uh, what I'm concerned about it is sort of like the, you know, the Hopi prophecy where there's one timeline that terminates and there's one that continues on. And we're, we're, we have to choose what timeline we want to be on. It's called the um, prophecy rock or whatever. It's this etching that the Hopis have. Have you seen it? It's really cool. Um, or, or disturbing, depending on how you look at it. But, um, but uh, and I'm reminded also, you know, Colin Andrews is a very, very good friend of mine, the crop circle guy, of a crop circle that appeared some years ago that had, it was where, it's, it was how all the planets would be in the year 2036, but Earth was not in its orbit. Earth was missing. It, w it was sort of like a warning. Now this is 2014. Now that crop circle appeared in like, I don't know, late 90s or early 2000s. But, um, and I don't mean to be apocalyptic in what I'm saying, I'm just saying that um, as the wonderful Chinese expression goes, unless we change directions we're likely to end up where we're going. Where are we going? Where are we headed here? So. Um, I think that's one of the really uh, you know, important things to realize, and it can happen very, very quickly. This kind of, it's like in physics, and they talk about this um, with quantum uh, systems, is that you get to a certain uh, critical mass of coherence, like in superfluidity and helium, and like when 1% of those molecules or atoms of helium are aligned and become coherent, instantly all of them do, and it becomes what's called superfluidity. And so you have this phase transition, it's called, in physics. And so that can happen also with people. And uh, as Rupert Sheldrake pointed out, um, you know, in, in the whole concept of morphogenic uh, fields, uh, or it's sort of like the hundredth monkey effect, where a certain population learns something, and then when it reaches that critical mass, suddenly, uh, monkeys on other islands and in other areas that had no linear contact start automatically know how to do it also. So there's this non-locality of learning in large social systems and they've proven this with monkeys and primates and also with humans. So all I can say is that if all of us do what we should be doing, we'll hopefully reach that phase transition and move over to this other way of functioning. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, but it does seem to be increasing and so uh, Rupert Sheldrake uh, did some really great, uh, he's a biologist at Oxford, I believe, uh, who did some wonderful um, work on this in terms of morphogenic fields and uh, what's more popularly called the hunter's monkey effect. Uh, and uh, it, it's a real phenomenon. And, and so we have, to, we have to view it in a very, po that's why I tell people, like people going out, doing meditation together, making contact, putting even the thought or the intent, doesn't matter what you see, just intending to do the correct thing recruits people you'll never know and meet. It has an effect beyond what we can measure um, and, uh, and see. And so, you know, it's more important to do, to be in the moment and be in the intent and the process with a pure heart than to be worrying about the outcome. Not that you don't want to worry about the outcome. You want to see a good future. But if you stay in that process, it'll create the good future. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, you talked a year or two ago about representatives from a G8 country um, participating in a um, C5. Yeah, has there been any development with that? Yeah, so he's asking about uh, one of the G8 countries uh, who um, very supportive of the CE5 initiative and uh, since it's been a couple of years, I'll talk about it very directly. Um, the country is France. And um, so 
there was a president a couple years ago named Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, and Sarkozy's uh, people, who, the, his intelligence and Air Force people who briefed him on all this stuff were very, very interested in what we were doing. And one of the very old families in France um, that actually organized the beheading of Marie Antoinette, um, true, uh, had this old estate uh, in uh, Brittany and uh, invited us there. So what we did a couple years ago, under the ruse of a training, just a, a, a weekend training, is that nobody who came knew this, except a couple of people. Well, of course, my wife knew. She knows everything. Um, <laughs> we had this thing, and of course I knew that it was going to be, we used this 2200 acre estate and there were there was an admiral there who was very high up um, and also he, this admiral had a PhD in uh, physics uh, and is also like myself an MD very 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 wonderful man and a couple other people and the host family who of course was a very old uh, you know, French Foreign Legion, diplomats, a family of very, very old French. Um, and so we did this, this is sort of a training, but so also so the, 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 government, uh, the, the friendly people in the French government could learn the protocols and see. And so they were there. And then I heard back afterwards that uh, they had the whole area, not cordoned off, but there was a security, uh, observational security perimeter around it. And they tracked, uh, craft coming over the, at 200,000 kilometers an hour during the CE5. And it was just a group of novices. Most of them had never been out. Um, and we had some amazing experience, including if you've seen the photo, uh, we were setting up one evening. And I, everyone on the side of the, the part of the circle where I was sitting, we saw this. I was just setting up to do this uh, Sanskrit Vedic puja. And there was this, like this, like a rainbow light that came in just in an instant. And so I had someone take a photograph, and there was this sort of royal purple mauve-colored fuzzy disc hovering right above the field. It's in this photograph, stunningly gorgeous. Not quite in this dimension, but not out of it either. On the, in the, but everyone looking in that direction saw this thing flash in. And, um, and then we were sitting there one night, and this object came over, and then we had all the cars, there were like 30 cars in this field, because we had like 60 people at this thing. And they all started turning their lights on and off. So this thing went over the vehicles, and, <laughs> and it was like, this is like something out of a Close Encounters of the Third Kind movie. And of course, you know, the Admiral's going, holy shit, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and we're in deep meditation, and all of a sudden we hear this, it, right next to where, the, beyond where the cars were, this, it was almost like a metallic thing brushing up again. There was a craft that was quasi-materialized in the corner of the field. And uh, later I went out and there were these little beings, there were about five of them. And you could hear, now the problem is everyone got up and it scared the hell out of them. So you heard this, them scampering off. And so they scampered off and then dematerialized in thin air. Sort of like that one that was in the crop circle a couple years ago where they saw the feet and the police saw this tall, luminous white being that was fully materialized, and the police got out and chased it, and the footprint, and then it just disappeared into the field in thin air. You know that case? Oh, well, I was right there when that happened. Yeah, it's near Silbury Hill. Anyway, these expeditions are awesome. You want to come on them, you should come. But, but the point is, is that, so they were very, very interested. Now, from there, in terms of bureaucracy, they're, like in any government, there are people who are part of this Magic or Majesty Group, Majestic has different acronyms. Now it's called SIG, Senior Interagency Group, Intelligence Group. They some were friendly, some were not friendly. Um, and when you're talking about a government moving off the dime on this openly, it's very difficult. But it's a it, again, it's an iterative learning process. And so, uh, the way I view it is that you know, see one, do one, teach one. You, you, you demonstrate it, and then hopefully, and I know that they're learning, and probably they're practicing it. 
Uh, now, the, the ethical construct and the philosophical underpinning of it is that it has to be done within the context of universal peace. It cannot be done within the context of one national entity vaulting itself over another, et cetera. Um, but I know that you know, this is not going to be able to be done through the UN because we tried that you know, back when um, Boutros Boutros Ghali was UN Secretary General and I, you know, I, they were very interested and his wife came to one of the salons I held in New York and then um, the um, Secretary General after him, Kofi Annan, um, when we did Disclosure Project, originally they had committed to hold the Disclosure Project event at, at the Secretariat uh, of the United Nations. But some folks came in with an all-access pass and essentially threatened to pull funding out of the UN on behalf of a certain number of countries, and it would destroy the UN. And I was told, I was called directly by an ambassador who was attached to the UN Secretary General saying, we wish you well, we support what you're doing, but we cannot do it at the UN. And that's why it was held here at the National Press Club. I have not told that story much. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, you look over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of initiatives from the starts and stops from various governments. And so, yeah, there's a lot of interest. Um, but it, it's sort of like, you know, that old saying, everyone wants to be first to be second. No, every, you know, there's a hesitancy to stick your neck out too far on something very controversial, as I mentioned earlier, but also on something that has um, not, not just a social opprobrium, but where there's some very powerful people who are, are not afraid of using their power in retribution against uh, an entity that would do it. And this is why I tell people the best, you know, to me, the clearest path forward for contact, disclosure, and bringing these technologies out are the people, masses of people doing it. Uh, large corporations, the very rich, governments. Um, you don't want to be prejudicial against them, which is why I'm like last year, I was happy to go to Australia and meet with all these folks. Um, but you don't expect, you don't, you, you have limited expectations. You hope they do the right thing. But what I learned starting back in the Clinton years is that everyone wants to know about this stuff. Very few people want to do anything about it. So knowing about it and doing something about it are two totally separate things. Uh, and all we can do, I think all of each of us can do, is to provide the information, the knowledge, the vision, and let that gather uh, amongst the populace and also with world leaders and other people and see where it goes. Um, and I, I have a very, not detached, but a very realistic philosophy about that. Um, and, you know, many people have said, well, you know, when is disclosure going to happen? I said, well, we did it already. And people think I'm joking. I said, no, when we started this, only about a quarter or a third of the people thought this was real. Now it's 50 some percent. Last year, the Marist poll said that 43 percent of, you know, of Americans think that we're currently being visited by interstellar extraterrestrial beings. It's a huge number. So I said, in terms of the public, it's kind of there. In terms of officialdom, and what I call the hidebound, inborn elite, the, the sort of inbred elite of the world, uh, there's, you know, that's a, a harder thing to get through. Uh, and no smart part because of both power politics, but also more easily, as, as, as this one Air Force uh, witness told me, he says, the real way this has been kept secret is just sheer ridicule. The subject, you know, you really don't have to do or say anything. It hides itself because people don't want to be laughed at. People don't want to be put down by their peers. People don't want to be, uh, lose esteem amongst their colleagues and what have you. So talk about courage. The biggest courage it takes for someone who's interested in this is to speak the truth in a way that is appropriate. Um, you can't bring everything out to someone who doesn't know anything about it, but that's why we put Disclosure Project, the book, and the videos together, so that anyone who's even at the le level of the most basic linear understanding will say, boy, where there's smoke, there's fire, because here's, there, here's a lot of information. 
um, from people who with sterling credentials. And, you know, and there is this sort of uh, strange hypocrisy um, with uh, the mainstream media, and that is if you had three people who would go on record with the New York Times or Washington Post about a senior person at the White House having sex with someone, it'd be all over. I have 110 people on videotape and testimony with corroborating documents, with their DD-214s, which is their discharge papers from the military, with st signed statements, witness oaths that they would testify under oath before Congress with the penalties of perjury, federal penalties of perjury, and it gets ignored by all the mainstream media. You talk about a double standard. So this is, of course, what we're up against um, because the, the big mainstream media, again, not so much, now some of them are tied into, quote, the cabal, if you want to call it that, that keeps it secret, but most of them, it's like this, uh, I have a family member who will remain nameless, who used to be the city editor of the Boston Globe. And when she found out I was getting involved with this stuff, she says, I don't care if you put a dead extraterrestrial body on my desk. We're not going to run this story. We're a blue chip paper. That belongs in the National Enquirer, and it would never appear in the Boston. I mean, it was just like that. This is a family member. So, and, and this was not, I assure you, it's not someone on the payroll of the CIA, like Donald Menzel was or, or Professor Condon. So I think that we have to understand that it is a real educational process. And uh, putting together the disclosure project information with top secret documents and military witnesses and generals and ministers of defense and people who have credentials and respectability, as it were, as pilots or people who are at Strategic Air Command, that's very important. And that body of information is sitting there for anyone to take virtually for free. I mean, we have 60 some of these people's testimony up on the site on YouTube now for free. You know, so that is important that all of us just share that with folks. Um, when you get to governments in these G8, you know, it's very interesting. Before I went over there, I regret that this wasn't actually in the film Sirius. It got, the director took it out and I don't know why. Um, but I have this beautiful letter, it's in French, um, from this admiral and the team who wrote about their commitment to make a long-term commitment for this journey with these visitors from other star systems. And amazing. And it's actually from the Ministry of Defense of France on their letterhead, signed. It is the most important government document in the history of the UFO subject, and <coughs> there it sits in my vault. Um, but, uh, so, you know, what I say to folks is that over the last, that was just a few years ago, that that process continues, but it's usually very quiet. 